dutifully chose all the hymns today that had the word love in it, and then she played so beautifully, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. And we're going to preach today on fathers. No. <laughs> no, no. No, we didn't pick on the moms, so we're not going to pick on the dads either. We're going to continue in our study in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to see the word charity, which modern English has taken and used love as sort of an umbrella uh, word. Love could mean the love that I have for a friend. It could mean the love that I have for a spouse. It could mean the love that I have for my children. It could mean the love that I have for fellow man. It could mean the love that I have for the church. But the translators of the King James made a conscious choice to take a word and translate it, in, translate it into English as charity. And most people, when they or memorize 1 Corinthians 13, when I had to memorize it for a wanna, now we're going way back, son, <laughs> back to the old days, to the old country, you know? <laughs> and when I had to memorize it for a wanna, I had to memorize it and I had to say, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity bracket, love bracket. You had to say the brackets, and that's how I had to memorize it so that when we did Bible quizzing, you would have to say it. You would have to say the brackets. I think it does a disservice for us to, uh, to try and swap out that word for love because I don't believe it's a one-for-one. One. Charity is not a, a one-for-one. One. And we're going to consider that as we go on. But I think that we have lost sight of this concept of charity. But Paul, at the end of chapter 12, makes this statement. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but I want to read the last line of chapter 12. It says, And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. Paul has said there is a better way for the Corinthian Christians to walk in. They have been walking in a puffed up way. They have been walking in a prideful way. They have been seeking the, the chiefest gifts. They want all the gifts that, that have all the flash and the bang and the pizzazz. But Paul says there's a better way for you to walk in, and that better way is the way of charity. Now what is charity? A contrast to what is what is this way that we are to walk in what is Paul saying let me contrast this well these are questions that should immediately jump to our mind when we consider the text and that's what we want to examine as we read so let's read one of the most familiar passages in Scripture first Corinthians 13 though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. 
Our Father and our God, we pray that you would give us wisdom. May your Holy Spirit move in our midst today so that we might understand the truths that you have for us. We rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by saying this. This chapter is not about marriage. We've had chapters on marriage in Corinthians. Paul's dealt with marriage matters. But this chapter, how many times have you been at a wedding and one of the key verses, maybe the, the text that the pastor preaches from, is 1 Corinthians 13, and he might have some snappy title like, what's love got to do, got to do with it, or something like that, you know. And, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, what's the deal? What are we talking about here? Paul does not have his authorial intent, the intent that he as the author of 1 Corinthians has, is not to write a treatise on how married couples are supposed to love each other. We've got to remember what has he been talking about. In chapter 11, he has been concerned how the church behaves itself during communion. In chapter 12, he has been consumed with how the church uh, behaves itself in regard to gifts. In chapter 13, why would he all of a sudden leap to some other thought? He's not. He is not jumping to another thought. He's saying this is how the church behaves itself in regard to relationships with each other. So charity, we begin to understand from authorial intent, from what Paul means, we begin to understand that Paul is saying here, Corinthians, the better way to walk in is a way that considers other before self. Considers other before self. The English word charity, Webster's Dictionary translates charity this way. That disposition of heart which inclines men to think favorably of their fellow men and to do them good. Now this is the same word that dozens of other times in the Bible, in Greek, is translated as love, agapetos, or agape, or one of its uh, um, forms. Why here do the translators change to a different word? I believe they were trying to bring into English Paul's meaning in this text. The opposite of love is often said to be hatred. Why? Because it's seeking to, to balance emotion off of emotion. Love is an emotion, hatred is an emotion, so we have love on one side and hate on the other side. Love and hate are emotionally charged words in the English language. But what is the opposite of charity? It's not hate, it's selfishness. The opposite of charity is selfishness. And that's the heart of what Paul is combating at Corinth. Selfish desires that are motivated by puffed up hearts. And hopefully we'll see that the antidote to this is charity. That's what Paul wants us to see. Paul wants us to see that the right way to live in is a way of charity. The antidote to the selfishness that had pervaded the Corinthian church, that had destroyed marriages, that had destroyed relationships, that had people taking communion in separation and not allowing some people to come in and take communion, that had been seeking gifts, that had been saying, look at how flashy I am, look at how great I am, I'm necessary for the church, you're just a nobody in the church. You don't get to take communion. Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a better way for the church to walk than this way. What Paul is teaching is that the primary indicator for spiritual maturity is not found in your spiritual giftedness, but it's found in your charity. Did you hear that? How do I know a spiritual person when I meet them not because they are particularly gifted but because because they are particularly charitable. that shows your maturity better than anything else and this is what Paul is trying to expound for us so the text breaks down very easily for us into three different sections the first section deals with the concept that gifts are actually useless without charity Gifts are useless without charity, in verses 1 to 3. Then the second section breaks down to us this way, that charity must be defined and described, in verses 4 to 7. Finally, the final section 
is charity endures in verses 8 to 13. So the first thing that we want to look at today is gifts without charity are useless in verses 1 to 3. Now, I don't know if you remember or not because it's been a while, but if you hold your finger in 13 and just flip back to chapter 8, Paul has already introduced us to this theme in verses 1 to 3. It says, now as touching, offered, or touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. So we see that, that begins to explain to us the concept that Paul is thinking of when he thinks about charity. There Paul contrasts one specific gift, knowledge, the gift that the Corinthians claimed that they had in spades. They claimed that they were a knowledgeable people. And he says, let me contrast the knowledge that you have with charity. There Paul says knowledge can puff you up, but charity will build up the church. There, knowledge is ultimately imperfect, but when you love God, that will shine through in your actions. So now Paul is going to compare charity with a few more gifts so that he might show how useless these gifts are without charity. So he's going to give us in these three verses three conditional statements that help us understand how the church is to behave decently and in order. Because remember, the whole concept builds to chapter 14, where Paul says that he wants everything in the church to be done decently and in order. And if the church is not behaving itself decently and in order, then the church is going across or against the Pauline mandate that has been given to us, which is an apostolic mandate, which is the same as if Jesus said it to you. So what Paul is saying here, that everything that the church does should be done decently in order, is as if Jesus is standing in the very room here with us, and he is saying, church, behave yourself. Church, behave yourself. Now these conditional statements all have three different elements. They have a condition, they have a contrast, and they have an assertion. So to help guide us on a more excellent way, Paul shows us, what charity is about. And he shows us that charity is not that thing which authenticates spiritual people. You don't know that you're a spiritual person just because you do something. That's interesting. It's not some flashy, showy gift like the Corinthians were craving. Charity shows our Christian maturity. Can I say this? carefully. I've been in classrooms with some of the most learned men in this country as far as theology goes. And as I have sat with them, you can tell the ones that know something and you can tell the ones that love someone. And there are some people who can know something and they can know it very well but at the end of the day, you can't see that they love someone. Are you, are you picking up what I'm laying down? It doesn't matter how brilliant you are if you don't have charity. And that's what Paul's going to be. And it, can, I, can I put it in the opposite just for fun? Just for fun on a Sunday morning here at Grace. It doesn't matter how stupid you are if you have charity. Did you hear? That's encouraging for me. I don't know about you, but it's encouraging for me. It helps me say, well, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box. Sometimes the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. Sometimes I don't have a full deck of cards that I'm playing with. But yet if I'm charitable, then the Lord overlooks that. Because I'm in a condition do you know what the condition is? You know, everybody's got a condition. Be careful with that person. They've got a condition. <laughs> you know what the condition is that I have? I am dealing in two worlds. I'm dealing in the spiritual, and I'm dealing in the flesh. And in the spiritual, you try the best that you can. 
But Paul's going to talk about the fact that we have a problem. We see through a glass darkly. That's a condition. That's a condition that we have. So, conditional statements. What are these conditional statements that Paul makes? The first one is in verse 1. And the condition that he gives is, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. That's the condition. That's, he's saying, imagine this. So this is the language that you've got to use in your mind. Imagine this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Now he gives two different tongues. Uh, a, a, a man tongue and an angelic tongue. And I believe that in both cases he's speaking in hyperbolic language. I believe that he's saying, imagine that I could speak in every tongue that there is known to mankind. And imagine that I could speak in, if there was some angelic language. Now, Paul is not arguing for an angelic language here. He's using hyperbole. You never try to draw a doctrine from hyperbolic language. Remember what a hyperbole is? I think there were a million people at church this morning. <laughs> you know. It's hyperbolic language. So when Paul is using this kind of speech, you've got you've to understand what is the point that Paul is trying to make. And the point that he is trying to make is that if I have the best ability with tongues, if I'm able to speak in every language known to mankind, if I have the best ability with the ability to speak even in some sort of uh, heavenly language, if there were such a thing, but then he gives a contrast and have not charity. There's the contrast. Then he gives an assertion. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Paul teaches us in these contrasting statements that it is not an either-or situation. It's either you're gifted or you have charity. No, charity is what tempers the giftedness. So what is, the, what is he saying in this first statement? Well, first he's saying that tongues, some supernatural ability to speak in known languages, is nothing but noise apart from charity. And speaking in angelic language is nothing but tinkling cymbals or sounding brass. What is he saying to us? If all you have is the ability to speak like this, then all you're going to hear is a cacophony of noise, and you're going to have no idea what it is, and it's going to be absolutely useless. It's interesting that Paul regularly demotes tongues throughout Corinthians. I think this is because the Corinthians craved tongues more than anything else. It stands out to me that even if you believe tongues are still for today, how can you read chapter 12's assertion that not everyone speaks in tongues and say that this is a gift that you must display to prove your salvation? Or how can you understand what Paul is saying here that it's just noise without charity? So the first con condition gives us clarity. What is important? Charity. The next one's going to give us the same theme in verse 2. What's the condition? Here he gives a condition with a series. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, that's the condition. Then the series is, and I understand all mystery, and though I have all faith. And then it gives us a result, so that I could remove mountains. If I have this ability to have so much faith that I'm able to remove a mountain. Now again, he's speaking in hyperbolic language. I don't think he's going back to what Jesus said when Jesus said about the faith of the grain of a mustard seed, because Jesus is talking about just a little bit of faith. But what Paul is talking about here is an excessive, excessive amount of faith. He's talking about everything in excess in this verse. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I could understand all mysteries, if I could have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and then he gives us the contrast. What's the contrast? And have not charity. Now he goes a step further in this one. First, in the first one, he's sounding brass or tinkling cymbal, just a, a noisy sound. In this one, he says, I am nothing. I am nothing. Paul uses other grace gifts here in verse 2. He started with tongues, but here he uses a few more grace gifts, still using hyperbolic language. He's gifted. Paul is gifted. Paul is 
Still highly flawed, though, even though he's gifted. Paul doesn't know everything, and he's not claiming that he knows everything. He's merely using an extreme example. And here Paul's language is so strong, he says, even in this extreme condition, he says, I'm still nothing. Well, what does he mean? Well, we said earlier, we're making a proposition. What's the proposition that we're making? The proposition that we're making is that the way you measure is not by how much you know, not how much you're able to say, not how much you're able to do, but you're measured by what? Charity. So Paul's whole point that he's making is simply this. If I'm able to do all of these fantastic things, but yet you lay a measuring stick next to me and I have no charity, where am I going to land on that measuring stick of charity? Nowhere. Because I'm nothing. He is both nowhere and nothing without charity. Well, that's pretty strong language, Paul. That's something that we should take notice of. The second condition further clarifies Paul's thought for us. Then he gives one final conditional statement in verse 3. The condition is, and this one, I, I want you to really note this one. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. What's he saying? If I give it all away. Everything. And though I give my body to be burned. Even give myself away so much. Now, depending on how you read this, that he's, he's burning with zealousness or literally giving up his life. I would lean towards literally giving up his life. And have not charity. It doesn't profit me anything. Now, what does that mean? Because this one, this one interests me more than the first two. Because what is the heart of charity? The heart of charity is, charity is feeding the poor and caring for those who are less fortunate than you and making sure that you do what you can to help those people who are in need. And Paul describes exactly that. If I'm able to help those who are in need, and if I'm able to do externally everything that you would imagine charity would be, everything that you would imagine charity to be, if I'm able to do that externally, but I don't have charity internally, then the external counts for nothing. So what we are learning in this third condition is that charitable actions are not inherently charity. Did you hear that? Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came to America, we all know the quote, you know, America is great because America is good, and when America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. But one of the things that stood out to Alexis de Tocqueville when he came to America was the opposite of France. France had no charitable organizations. Alexis de Tocqueville comes to America and everything that was being done, there was no socialistic system in America at that point. There was no, the government was not handing out free bre bread, free phones, free nothing. So everything that was being done for the poor was all being done from the charity people of the United States of America. And they were caring for them, and there were charitable organizations for everything. Everything. And it was incredible to Alexis de Tocqueville that this could be the case. But yet, here's the reality. There are many people today who give faithfully to charitable organizations and who do the most that they can to make sure that good is being done positively in this world, but they don't inherently possess charity. Isn't that an interesting thought? That should be almost frightening to us. That means that we have to learn what charity is. Well, the Apostle Paul says, let me teach you. Let me teach you what charity is. If charity is not tied up in externals, then what is it tied up in? So that leads us to the second portion where charity is defined and described for us in verses 4 to 7. We know we need charity, but why do we know we need charity? What is charity? So Paul gives an almost hymnic description of what charity is. Charity is qualitatively and quantitatively Christ-likeness. What does that mean? 
draw charity, write charity on a piece of paper, write an equal sign, and write Christ-like on the other side. That's the equation. So no matter which way you read the equation, if I've got charity, I've got Christ-likeness. If I've got Christ-likeness, I've got charity. It doesn't matter on, on either side of the equation. It's the same. So charity equals Christ-likeness, and Christ-likeness equals charity. And that's what Paul was teaching us. We learned that charity is an action that builds up the church in chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Charity is not a static concept. Just like, can I say this, holiness is not a static concept. You know what that means? Holiness is not a jacket that you put on in the morning. Holiness is an action. Charity is not a jacket that you can put on in the morning. Charity is an action. Charity is something that is a concept that is continually moving forward. So, if charity is rooted in Christ's likeness, then what is Christ's highest expression of love for us? Well, chapter 1 says it's the cross. Chapter 1 says this is where the pinnacle of wisdom is found, in the cross. And Paul's going to build the twin truth, the cross in chapter 1, and the resurrection in chapter 15. But here in the text... Paul explains what charity is. In English, we see 15 verbal phrases that are used. Because remember, what is a verb? It's an action, right? And so these actions are used to describe charity in these four verses. What does it mean? Charity suffers long. Well, it doesn't seek self-priority. Charity is kind. It's not harsh. Charity envieth not. Well, that means it looks lovingly towards each other, not enviously towards each other. Well, that person, I can't stand the way they look. They look better than I do. Pastor K has hair. You know, you can become envious. And then you just remind yourself, well, in the morning, I don't have to style my hair. <laughs> it's just I can just, I can wash my hair with a washcloth. So, you know, <laughs> I save on this time. Charity vaunteth not itself. What does that mean? It doesn't boast. It's not in the business of boasting. It's not puffed up. That's a slap at the Corinthians, whom Paul has said on repeated occasions, are puffed up. It doth not, doth not behave itself unseemly. That means it doesn't act in terrible ways. It seeketh not her own. It looks towards others. It's not easily provoked. Have you ever met someone who's easily provoked? Uh, if you haven't, shake hands with Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah struggles with provocation. He is, of the six children that I have, the other five kids all know how to push Isaiah's buttons. <laughs> and he seems so quiet and mild manner when he's here at church, but then somebody does something to him, and he, what? And you're like, whoa, Isaiah, take a breath. <laughs> Not easily provoked. <coughs> Thinks no evil. I pondered this this week. You know, I've been living with this chapter all this week. Thinks no evil. I think the biggest problem that we have as Christians is that we always automatically assume the worst of everybody. Somebody says something to you and you believe it. You don't seek it out. You don't try to find out if it's truth. I have made it a practice now. If you come to me, <laughs> this is just a warning for you. If you come to me and you say to me, Pastor, so-and-so has done something or, or, or other, I'm going to take your hand and I'm going to say, well, come walk with me. Let's go talk with that person face to face and see if they've done it. Because I think that's a far better way for Christians to behave than to say, oh, really? I didn't know that. And then you turn to the next person and say, guess what so-and-so did? It doesn't automatically assume the worst. It bears all things. It rejoices not in iniquity, not in sin. It rejoices in truth, the things that are of God. It bears all things. That's the means by which we support each other through this life. It believes all things. It's not necessarily or inherently cynical. It hopes all things. It hopes for the best. It endures all things. Remember, this, the concept that he is having is how do you build a community of Christians? 
How do you build a community of people who are radically different from each other? How do you build a community of people who don't have the same interests, who don't have the same likes and dislikes, who don't have the same cares, who don't have the same background? How do you do that? Well, it's only through charity. That's the only means that a church can be built together. It endures all things. Charity is the means for our endurance. Now this is supposed to cause us to stand back in awe at the many splendor diamond that is charity. But he doesn't stop there. In the third section, he tells us that charity endures. Now this is his final division in the text, and he tells us at the beginning of it that charity is unfailing. It never fails. We're supposed to think of eternity in this final section. The spiritual gifts in verses 8 to 9, we are shown are imperfect. What does that mean? Charity never fails, but guess what? Prophecies, they're going to fail. Tongues, they're going to cease. Knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Why? Because we know in part and we prophesy in part. Because we are in an incompleted state right now. Not that this is false. These are spiritual gifts. But they are based on an imperfect fact. Why do we need prophecy? Why do we need uh, tongues? Why do we need knowledge? Because we are in veiled physical bodies. So verse 10 goes on and says, But that which is perfect, or but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now I've wrestled with this. I've sought to make it be the Bible. I've sought to understand it through a particular lens. We actually hotly debated this in class in January. But I finally arrived at the belief that I think this is speaking of the eschaton or the eternal state. Because these are now-then statements. And I have to assume, when I read this, I have to assume that the author's intent, that Paul's intent, is for us to understand what he says because he means what he says. So I have to understand this. My knowledge is still incomplete with the Bible in my hand. Did you know that? I can have the Bible in my hand and my knowledge in this earth still be incomplete. I still mess up. I still get things wrong. I am still not sinlessly perfect. But... I will be. Not when this came to me, but I will be someday in the eschaton, in the last day. I believe that the gifts were vanishing away in 55 AD when Paul wrote this. But what does verse 11 mean then? He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't believe that Paul is speaking of himself here. I believe that he is using an illustration. What is the illustration that he is using? The age that we are in is like childhood that requires certain aids to get through it. You know, when I learned how to ride a bike, no, I'm not a good example. I didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was 13 and it was a nightmare. So let's not use that example. <laughs> when my children learned how to ride a bike, <laughs> we had training wheels on them at first. And they would ride up and down the road with training wheels. Why? Because they needed aids to get through. But now at this point, all of the older kids hop on a bike and they just go. They don't need training wheels. Why? Because they've arrived at something. That's the now-then concept. So what Paul is speaking of is he's speaking of a now-then concept. He says, right now in this earth, we need all of these aids. Why do I think that I can somehow stand here on a Sunday morning and insert myself between the Word of God and you with the express purpose of trying to teach you when you can open the Word of God yourself and read it? Why do I think that? Because we're living in an imperfect age. Yes, you can open the Word of God. Yes, you can read it for yourself. But 
That is not always the means that God has chosen in this life when you have the flesh condition that we talked about at the beginning. Your mind is structured in certain ways that it shouldn't ought to be structured in. And depending on what you're viewing, depending on who you're hanging around with, depending on where you're going, depending on where you're at, that can cloud and confuse how you read the Bible. So the purpose of the pastor is for him to be a curator who walks through a museum with you and points out to you the very important things that are said in God's Word to help you see it as truth and to help you say, wow. Have you ever been to a museum by yourself? And you look at things and you're like, wow, that's really cool. And you have about 10 minutes of looking at things and you're thinking, wow, that's really cool. And then you walk on through. But when you go on an art tour with a museum curator, it takes you hours to get through there. Why? Because they want to show you everything. They hold the, Mo or they don't hold the Mona Lisa, but they let you look at the Mona Lisa and they show it to you and they say, look, she doesn't have eyebrows. And you think to yourself, well, I didn't notice she didn't have eyebrows. You know? And so he's curating this. He's putting this on display for you. As a pastor, I seek to curate the Word of God and put it on display for you week after week and show you and say, examine it. Look at it again. There was one uh, scientist that talked about when he first went to class, his professor said to him, look at the fish. And he said, I thought, what does that mean? And he said, for 10 minutes, I looked at the fish. And he said, I thought, okay, I'm, I've looked at the fish. The professor came back through and said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm writing down what I observed. He said, no, don't write down what you observed, the fish. An hour went by, and the professor came back and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm writing it. No, don't look at, write down what. For three days, he had this man look at a fish. And he said, in three days' time, he said, I saw more about a fish than I ever imagined I could possibly see in my life. Now, I've just spent a week staring at the fish in 1 Corinthians 13. And I try to bring it to you. And you guys sit here, and you open your mouths, hopefully. Some of you don't. Some of you just get it on your face because you forgot you had to open your mouth this morning. And I try to feed to you what I've seen from the fish. When we're considering charity as a church, I think we ought to do more than just say, well, I guess I'm supposed to leave this morning thinking the pastor said I ought to love people more. I think that hopefully you would leave this morning and say, love is an incredible thing. Charity is an incredible concept. And I perhaps have not been doing charity well. I've been thinking about other people in ways I ought not think about them. I've been behaving in ways that I ought not be behaving. Because guess what? The climax, even though we see in verse 11, Paul's, Paul's illustration in verse 12, another illustration that we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now in part, then shall I know even as also I am known. Verse 11 and 12 both give us these now then formats, but then verse 13 is the climax of the chapter. And in verse 13, he says, for this age, right now, you need faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Why? Why? Because charity is going to go on into the eschaton. Charity is going to go on forever. Faith will one day become sight. When I'm standing, or rather when I'm sprawled out flat on my face, before the very throne of Jesus Christ and worshiping him, I will not need faith because I will see him. I will not need hope because I'm already in the best possible condition that I could ever possibly be in. My faith will become sight, my hope will be fulfilled, but my charity will go on. Spiritual maturity is marked with charity. This charity is not to be confused, and I think we have to conclude with this thought. 
that this charity is not to be confused with niceness. Did you hear that? It's not to be confused with weakness. It's not to be confused with softness. It's not to be confused with indulgence. I love my children, but I don't give them everything. You know, it always astounds me when somebody says about their kids, I want to give them more than I had when I was a kid. If you think you turned out okay when you were a kid, then why not give your kids the same thing? <laughs> What's this concept? I want to give them more than I had when I was a kid. Give them less. They're tough. Make them hardy. Let them outside. Let them run around with the wolves for a while. Let them grow up and become men and women that are actually worth something in this society. Love is not indulgence. Love is not permission. Charity is not permission. Charity is not any other of the host of wrong ideas that have popped up about it today when everybody says, well, I think you're a Christian, or I don't think you're a Christian because you don't have X, Y, or Z. I want to say this. Charity will go to war for the truth. Charity will correct error. Charity will not bow to naivete. Charity will not roll over and play dead. Charity will, I want you to hear this, charity will create division. It will create division. Charity will alienate people. Because charity is so much more than a cup of cold water. Charity is the embodiment of Christ-likeness. The embodiment of Christ-likeness. Charity is something that we work out. Isn't it interesting that in chapter 12, all of the other spiritual gifts are given according to the Spirit's will? But in chapter 13, everybody's expected to have charity. So charity is the birthright of the believer. And it is achieved how? By walking in the Spirit. So charity marks you. So I have a question for you this morning. Are you marked? Are you marked with charity? Or is it all just externals? And you've missed the internals. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come before you humbly. We come before you recognizing that we have been weak and niggardly in our treatment of charity. And we pray, Father, that you would cause us to be a charitable people. We pray, Father, that you would help us to work this out. We pray, Father, that you would help us to meditate on this. Lord, as we leave this place today, may the word of God not leave us, but may it hang with us throughout the day. And may we embrace the role that charity has been given as the spiritual marker of our maturity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.